Good morning, everybody. And thank you, White, for that reading. Wasn't that a lovely song that the music team have written? Uh, It's a great thing, I think, for a church to write its own songs. And wouldn't it be great if in the fullness of time we had an album of songs that have been written by the music team? That would be a wonderful thing. Well, friends, this morning we're going to cover chapters 5 to 7 in Esther. And um, we're doing this series in three chunks. Last week, chapters 1 to 4, 5 to 7 today, and then the rest of the book next Sunday morning because um, I think it helps us to see how the story works to do it in fairly big blocks. But let's start by asking for the Lord's help in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we, we thank you that through the Lord Jesus, you have made it possible for us to come boldly to you as our Heavenly Father. And we ask that as we look at this portion of your word, that you would speak to us, that you would rebuke us as we need it, challenge us as we need it, and teach us as we need it. So please make this a special time for everyone here today, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't know if you remember, but last week um, in our prayer meeting, we were reminded that during the course of this year, half the world's population are going to be voting in elections. Amazing. And of course, here in South Africa, we've got our elections, haven't we, at the end of next month. But uh, given all of the problems that are, are multiplying, I think, around the world at the present time, the question that many people are asking is this. Who is actually in control? It's a question we ask here in this country, uh, and of course I think it applies on the wider stage as well. It's an important question, and actually it's a question that hangs over the entire Bible story from beginning to end. Because the Bible story establishes who is in control of the world. The book of Esther opens up a vital perspective on this. Because it's the question that God's people were asking in Esther's day as they faced a terrifying and powerful opposition. Last Sunday morning we looked at the first four chapters and we saw, didn't we, that God's providence was demonstrated in raising up a beautiful Jewish girl, an orphan, to become the queen of the entire Persian Empire. She became the consort of uh, King Xerxes. But then we also saw at the king's right hand a man called Haman. And Haman was an Amalekite and therefore one of the sworn enemies of the people of God. And we saw that from the earliest days in Israel's history the Amalekites had opposed and attacked the people of Israel, the Jewish people, at every opportunity. Now, at this point in the story, the story, uh, the part of the story we've got to today, Haman has persuaded King Xerxes to issue an edict authorising the mass slaughter of the Jews. Uh, The date when this is going to happen has been set for 11 months down the road on the eve of the Passover festival. And therefore, Esther's fate, as chapter 5 begins is very much in the balance. But Esther has a cousin called Mordecai. Uh, He's an official in the king's court. He's also a faithful Jew. He refuses to bow down to Haman. You remember that uh, the king has commanded that everybody has got to bow down to Haman. So Haman is expecting everybody to do that. And Mordecai's refusal has made Haman boiling mad. And uh, that is the trigger for the edict to slaughter all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. But we saw at the end of chapter 4 that Mordecai has a plan that might just save his people. It involves Esther, 
And he says to her at the end of chapter 4 and verse 8, if you'd like to look at it, uh, that she's to go into the king's presence and to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Now the problem here is that Esther hasn't been in the king's presence for about a month and to barge in uninvited would mean certain death unless the king extends to her the golden scepter. But Mordecai is absolutely adamant, Esther's got to do this, and I wonder if you remember those memorable words in chapter 4 and verse 13, where Mordecai says, Do not think that because you're in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. So last week we ended, didn't we, with Esther being resolved to go and do this. Uh, She wants the Jews to spend three days fasting and praying for her. And then she says, yes, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so we we kind of left last week, didn't we, wondering how on earth all this is going to play out. And now this morning we come to chapters 5 to 7, which bring us to the turning point in the book. Uh, It's a wonderfully dramatic passage, full of tension, full of surprises. So like we did last week, first of all we're going to look at the story... And then at the end, we're going to see what it has to say to us today. Well, after the uh, three days of fasting, Esther approaches the king in chapter 5, and he receives her. Uh, Not only is that a very positive reception that nobody could have guaranteed, but you'll notice that it's followed by an offer of surprising generosity. Did you notice this? Uh, The king is prepared to give her up to half the kingdom. Uh, That's probably a kind of formal way of saying you can ask for whatever you want. And so she does. But what she wants is surprisingly trivial, isn't it? She wants to invite Haman and Xerxes to a banquet. Now, we're not uh, let in on her strategy at this point, but It's good to have something positive to offer the king before she makes her real request. And we already know, don't we, from chapter 1, that Xerxes is very keen on a good banquet. He had two of them back in chapter 1. And she's going to put one of those on for him. Now, there's a lovely, lovely little detail which is easy to miss in verse 5, where the king, who... We saw last week is famous for never making any decisions for himself, but always being led by other people. The king says, verse 5, bring Haman at once so that we may do what Esther asks. So who's in control really? Well, once again, the most powerful man in the world is following his instructions. And uh, at the banquet... Esther is asked for her request. Very surprisingly, she says, my request is that you come to a second banquet tomorrow night. Sounds a bit weird, but a great deal is going to happen in the story in the next 24 hours. Now, I'm sure you can see that the story is being told in a particular way to build the tension, build the excitement and the drama So that we're thinking to ourselves, well, what is going to happen? I mean, why doesn't Esther just come out with it? Then in chapter 5 and verse 9, we move outside the palace and we witness a violent mood change in Haman. I think verse 9 is a fascinating verse. It says, Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But then he saw Mordecai, and that really bursts his bubble. 
Uh, His joy at being the the only guest uh, with the king and queen is transformed into rage when he sees this Jew who flatly refuses to bow down to him. So what does he do? Well, he goes home and he pours out his distress to his wife. And uh, his wife and friends have got a very simple solution for him. Verse 14, have a gallows built, 75 feet high. That's pretty high. That's about up to the top of this roof here. And to ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to dinner and be happy. And we're told this suggestion delighted Haman and he had the gallows built. So, friends, at the end of chapter 5, things are looking pretty bleak for Mordecai and for the Jews. But notice this. In chapter 6 and verse 1, there is a very, very important sentence. That night, the king could not sleep. Now, why that particular night? Well, if you can't sleep, uh, reading can sometimes help you nod off again, uh, especially if it's the official record of all of your marvellous achievements as king for the 12 years that you've been on the throne. And uh, it just so happens that the person who's going to read to the king opens the account at the um, place where we read about Mordecai's loyalty in informing the king of the plot to assassinate him. So the king is reminded about that and he asks his question in verse 3 of chapter 6. He says, what what honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Well, the answer is nothing. It was five years ago, Mordecai hasn't been rewarded But we know, therefore, don't we, at this point, the king is thinking, well, what can I do for him? Well, uh, by this time, it seems that the night is over. Uh, We don't know whether the king nodded off again or not, but the morning has come, and Haman has arrived early at the palace to make his request. The king says, who's in the court? And in verse 4, Haman, we're told, has just entered the outer court of the palace. Now, I want you to notice what's happening here. The king is thinking, you know, what good can I do for Mordecai? Yes? And Haman is coming to say, well, get rid of him. Kill him. Hang him on the gallows. But before Haman can make his request, there is a second question in verse 6. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Now, as we've seen before, the king never initiates anything. He's a bit of a wimp. And so he asks Haman, what should we do to show our appreciation of a great man, a man the king wants to honour? And it's at this point that we see the full extent of Haman's pride and uh, his lust for glory. And I just love that sentence at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of verse 6, where Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would like to honour rather than me? So here I am, isn't it marvellous? And uh, the most elaborate honours are now proposed by Haman because he thinks he's going to get them. Uh, There's going to be a royal robe, Uh, a royal horse is going to be involved, Uh, there's even going to be a prince uh, as a servant, and then there's going to be a public proclamation at the end of verse 9, where the prince shouts out, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. And it's very interesting that it's precisely at this moment when Haman thinks that all his dreams are going to be fulfilled, that the crushing blow comes. Have a look at verse 10. Go at once, the king commanded Haman, get the robe and the horse, and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. 
Do not neglect anything you have recommended. (laughs) Well, Haman's got to do it, hasn't he? I mean, there's no wiggle room there. Of course, he's utterly deflated. So afterwards, what does he do? He goes home to his advisors and his wife and family, tells them what's happened. And they see all of this as very ominous indeed, as far as Haman is concerned. And I find their reaction fascinating. You'll see this at the end of verse 13 of chapter 6, where they say, well, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Now, the background to that is that the uh, Persians believed in plenty of gods, And they believed that the gods used to intervene in the lives of people in different ways. And here, it seems that Mordecai's family realised that if things are going... uh, uh, Sorry, Haman's family realise that if things are going Mordecai's way, well, obviously, there's a powerful god that the Jews believe in who's kind of working out all the details behind the scenes. And before Haman has an opportunity to process this, you'll notice that he's whisked away to the second banquet, which Esther has prepared. So, chapter 7, they arrive at the second banquet, and the king asks the same question he asked before, chapter 7, verse 2. Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Verse 3, very important verse. Esther replies, If I have found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. Because we've been sold for destruction and annihilation. Now, you can can sort of sense, you can feel the drama building up in the story. He's saying, I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, annihilated. And she goes on to say, if it were simply that we'd been sold into slavery, I wouldn't have bothered you. But the reality is we're going to be slaughtered. Well, the king has got absolutely no idea what she's talking about. And so in verse 5, he says, well... Who is he? Where is the man who's dared to do such a thing? And uh, Esther says, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Well, that's hardly surprising, is it? The king kind of storms out of the room in a rage. And Haman knows in his heart that the king has already decided his fate and his only opportunity, his only chance for survival is to beg Esther to intercede with the king for his life. But again, Haman badly messes it up. Look at verse 8. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king exclaimed, will he even molest the queen when she's with me in the house? I mean, it's the worst, isn't it, of all possible outcomes if you are Haman. Uh, You know, there he is, he's been planning to kill the king's loyal friend, Mordecai, and now it looks like he's trying to molest the king's wife and in the space of just... Two verses, just two verses. He's arrested and he's hanged on his own gallows. Just look at verse 9, chapter 7. One of the eunuchs attending the king said, A gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. He had made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he'd prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. 
Now, the picture here, friends, is a picture of complete and unexpected reversal. I mean, nobody could possibly have predicted this. So, it looks like good news, but the edict, you remember the edict that the king passed for the destruction of the Jews? Well, that still stands, so the Jews are still living with the threat of annihilation, even if their chief enemy has been executed. So, what's going to happen to the Jews? Well, stay tuned for next week's thrilling instalment. But uh, what are you and I to think about all of this today? Why is this intriguing story even in the Bible? Well, we just have to take a step back for a moment and remember that because the Bible is divinely inspired, it is always God's book about God before it is his book about human beings. And although the name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, the writer is very clearly giving us God's perspective on all these events at the centre of the most powerful empire in the whole world. For a start, God has placed his servants there, Esther and Mordecai. Humanly speaking, no one could have achieved that. But God has put them in just the right place at just the right time. And that, my friends, is teaching us that the government of the world is not ultimately in Xerxes' hands, however powerful he might appear to be. Because even when the book begins, Mordecai is already in the king's service. Uh, We're told he serves at the king's gate. That means he's got an official position of some kind. But he seems to be the only Jew who enjoys a privileged position like that. Uh, You may know from elsewhere in the Bible that some of the Jews had returned to Judah to rebuild the temple, and eventually others went to join them to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. But at this point in the history of Israel, the rebuilding program has stalled because the Jews have got lots of enemies all around the empire. And one of the most menacing and threatening is Haman himself. So the prospects for the Jews are very bleak indeed. The threat that they might be annihilated is very real. And the question is, who is in control? Because this is not just a political conflict. It's actually a conflict between God and his enemy, the devil, who wants to kill and destroy and frustrate all of God's purposes. And throughout the whole of the Old Testament, the devil's main objective, his number one plan, is to stop the coming of Messiah. The devil is determined to frustrate God's promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and the promise that through Abraham's seed all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, that's the Jewish people, isn't it? So, friends, throughout the Old Testament, the devil is fighting against that promise. He's trying his absolute hardest to bring the Jews into a situation where they cannot receive God's blessing. Now, that overview uh, of what's going on behind the scenes runs all the way, actually, from Genesis to Revelation. And it's the key to understanding uh, what's happening in this particular book. So, friends, I think we would expect to find in Esther themes that point towards their fulfilment in the New Testament and beyond. So you may remember that last time we said that in God's plan, there is a line that runs from the Jews as the old covenant people of God, scattered throughout the empire, to the church as the new covenant people of God. And today, well, we're on our way, aren't we, to our place in the new creation. But for the time being, Rather like the Jews in the Old Testament, we're scattered 
throughout the world. And although the world was created by God and is ruled by God and is loved by God, it is also a world that is in rebellion against God. As John says in his first letter, it is in the grip of the evil one. And Haman is a classic example of someone in the grip of the evil one. So with that kind of big picture in the back of our minds, in the last few minutes, let's just ask two questions to help us see what we can take away from all this into the week. First question, what is God showing us here about the hostile world? Haman is clearly a representative of that world. And we're told, aren't we, that Haman has been I think we would say super successful. Just look back to chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, We had this in our reading. We're told there that Haman boasted to his family about his vast wealth, many sons, and all the ways the king had honoured him. You need to know that in Persian society, many sons was a symbol of success. Um, they said actually that having many sons was second only in prestige to success on the battlefield. And Haman regards himself as tremendously successful, seriously important. Uh, He holds an important position in the royal court and he especially prizes the fact that he's above all the other nobles and all the other officials. And in verse 12... Chapter 5, he says, I'm the only person that Queen Esther has invited to accompany the king to the banquet that she gave. But you see, he couldn't be more important in his own mind. He's obsessed with himself uh, and his wealth and his position and his achievement. He's worshipping himself. Now, friends, that is the number one characteristic, isn't it? of the world in rebellion against God. And uh, that's why Mordecai's refusal to conform is so hateful to him. it, It enrages him. And although he's totally satisfied with himself and everything he's got, he says very tellingly, doesn't he, in verse 13 of chapter 5, all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. You see, Haman is never satisfied. He's always looking for more personal glory. And again, that's what the world is like, isn't it? This is where human nature will take every one of us apart from the grace of God. Looking for celebrity status... Uh, wanting the biggest following on social media. We've got to be important. It's all about me. And that's why, you see, Haman automatically thinks that Xerxes wants to honour him. I mean, in his mind, there's never a flicker of doubt about that. Which is why, of course, he proposes that ridiculous display of pomposity and pride. And yet... His situation is far more fragile than he thinks. Because within two days, he's dead. His friend Xerxes, who has favoured him so highly, has become his executioner. So the point is, friends, that just as Esther had to live in two worlds, the world of her Jewish upbringing and the world of the Persian court... You and I also have to live, and we do live, in two worlds. As Christians, we live in the world of God's kingdom. But for the time being, we also live in the kingdom of this world, the world in rebellion against God. It's all under God's control, of course. He's the God of all of it. But, friends, we shouldn't be surprised when we see evil expressing itself in this way. I guess in our culture, evil is exercised and expressed in the 
the madness of political correctness, uh, corruption in government, the drip feed of anti-Christian poison in social media. But you see, we shouldn't be surprised by that, but we shouldn't be alarmed by it either. So I think it's very helpful just to notice how Mordecai responded to Haman. Just have a look back to chapter 5 and verse 9. Verse 9 says, Mordecai neither rose nor showed fear in the presence of Haman. Now, I think he's modelling a really important principle for us. The principle is, fear God and you will not fear men. What an important lesson that is. And that's the perspective, you see, that's governing Mordecai, that's way bigger and greater than all worldly power. So for that reason, the second question we should be asking at this point in the book is, what does this story teach us about how God is in control? That's important for us to know, isn't it? Because God has given us uh, a window into the world and the way the world operates, but what about God and the way that God works in a hostile world? Well, as we're starting to see, this book reminds us that God overrules everything. He moves people, he engineers events, he creates particular circumstances to accomplish his purposes. And I think that's what Haman's family realise. Because their message to Haman at the end of chapter 6 is absolutely astonishing if you think about it. Verse 13. We looked at it once, look at it again. Since Mordecai is a Jew, well, if your downfall has started because of him, you can't stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Now that is an extraordinary verse because it's actually the message of the whole book on the lips of pagans. Because amazingly they've come to realise that to stand against God's people is actually to stand against God himself. So Haman is bound to lose. You know, God has made certain promises. He said to Israel that from their nation will come the great deliverer who's going to liberate the entire human race. Nothing is going to destroy that purpose. So when Mordecai says to Esther, if you remain silent, deliverance for the Jews will come from another place, what he's saying is that God can't be resisted. He is in control. But he's in control in ways that perhaps can't always be seen on the surface. Just notice how that pattern works out in the story. This is fascinating. Because, Because if you think about it, it just so happens that Esther replaces Queen Vashti. It just so happens that Mordecai uncovers the assassination plot at the king's gate. It just so happens that on one particular night... The king can't sleep. And it just so happens that when he asks somebody to read to him, that the book is opened at the place that tells the story of what Mordecai did. And it just so happens that Haman's pride is exposed and leads to his downfall. The point I'm making is that the hidden hand of God is everywhere in the story. God's fingerprints are all over it. So when Mordecai says deliverance will come, he's standing on the promises which God has made. And friends, if you think about it, as we look ahead from Esther into the New Testament, we see those promises being fulfilled in the work of Jesus. At the centre of everything, of course, is the cross, That's where Jesus achieves our deliverance. But I want you to see that the connections from Esther to to Jesus are startling. So we've seen, haven't we, that Esther becomes the divinely appointed intercessor 
whose, ple- whose pleas for her people are heard by the king and will be answered. But Jesus is the great intercessor, isn't he? Our names are written on his hands and written in his heart. And he pleads for us at the Father's throne. And he presents his completed work in his death on the cross to the Father. And through his precious blood, he intercedes. And we are forgiven and we are made acceptable to God and we wouldn't be otherwise. Next week, we're going to see that Mordecai becomes the righteous ruler in whom the whole city of Susa rejoices. And friends, you see, his promotion in a wonderful way points to the ultimate fulfilment where the Lord Jesus, risen, raised to the right hand of God, rules in righteousness and who is going to come back and bring in his perfect everlasting kingdom. Now, friends, all of these events in Esther are foreshadowing what's going to happen through Christ, our mediator and our ruler, our righteous king. And you see, it's his kingdom that we enter when we put our faith in Jesus. And when we do that, when we do that, we become part of that big picture story that goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation and that's going to be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus comes back. And uh, friends, let me say to us this morning that the call of the kingdom is for us to be living in light of that reality. And uh, the book of Esther shows us that just as God was all the time working for his people behind the scenes then, in an empire that was thoroughly pagan, So God is working in the same way today, even when it looks to us as if so many people are turning their backs on God. God is still very much at work. He's putting his people in the place that he wants them to be. He's moulding his church into the shape that he wants it to be. And all the time, all the time, he's bringing people out of darkness and into the light. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, where, as I'm sure you know, the established church has been in steep decline for several generations, there is today talk of revival in certain places. In fact, just this week, The Spectator, which is a a political journal, popular political journal in the UK, ran an article Uh, reporting a recent and totally unexpected awakening to the Christian message among writers and prominent thinkers and leaders. I mean, it's so surprising. It's so unexpected. At the other extreme, think of Iran. Iran is where Esther was. Esther was in Iran. Today, of course, we know Iran to be supporting Hezbollah and Hamas terrorists. It's governed by a brutal Islamic regime. And yet, in the last 10 years, there have been more than a million converts to Christianity in Iran. And the experts say that Christianity is growing faster in Iran than any other country on planet Earth. Did you know that? And because of the similarities in language and culture, the revival in Iran is gradually spreading across the border to Afghanistan, where today Christianity is growing almost as fast as it is in Iran. So you see, friends, God is assembling his people. And it's a vast multitude that no one can count. And he hasn't forgotten South Africa, because right across the country and in this city, there are people that God has raised up and is raising up. And if we're trusting in Jesus, we're in that number. 
Now, that, all of that means, friends, that you and I are to be people of vision and hope. And we're to remember that God is still very much at work behind the scenes. And he's given you and I a unique place in which to witness Cape Town. And he's given us a unique moment in history in which to do it. So let's ask God to be with us this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that these chapters open up your sovereign will, which you were working out in ways that no one could see at the time. When we look at the history of the church, we see that pattern repeated again and again across the world. And we pray that you would give us faith to see that our lives are not random, that it isn't an accident that we have the job that we have, or that we're living in the place where we live, or that we're in the family that we're a part of. So Lord, please give us the right perspective on your sovereign will and help us to live lives that glorify you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.